Has this ever happened to you? You get up in the morning and you think this is going to be a good day. God just seems very present to you, whether it's through a beautiful sunrise or a particularly meaningful passage in your daily devotional or a positive interaction with a family member. Everything just seems peaceful and and all seems right with the world. And then you get in the car to go to work or school and someone cuts you off. Mm. Or you open up your email and there's a really negative message from someone who's upset with you about something. Or you're at the grocery store and you ask a simple question to an employee and they're really rude to you in response. How quickly do you go from, thank you God for this amazing life, to, oh my gosh, that person is an idiot? What is wrong with people? That sense of peace just goes out the window and in its place is righteous indignation. A bruised ego, anger. And sometimes even a sense that this must be avenged. Get even. We'll get back at them. We'll show them a thing or two. So I asked if this ever happened to you, and of course the answer is yes. It's happened to you. It's happened to all of us. Which is what makes our our brief foray this morning into the life of David feel so very human for us. David is this incredibly human character in the Bible. And in many ways, through David, we can learn how to be human with all of our rough edges and earthiness and with all of God's grace and beauty present right there in the midst of it. We're here in this story today because, as we said, this week is Vacation Bible School Week. And what better way for us as a congregation to engage alongside the kids that we'll welcome into our building this week for Passport to Peace than to dig into a couple of the stories that they will be learning. One of the things that I love about this curriculum that we're using is that it includes some more familiar stories, like the Good Samaritan, but also some less familiar stories, like this one from 1 Samuel. My guess is that most of us have not spent much time with this story at all. I know I haven't, really. So come with me back in time, about 3,000 years, to the very early days of Israel. Saul is the first king of Israel, but things are not going too well for him. The prophet Samuel has shown up and anointed David as the future king, which was fine at first, but then when the young David defeated the Philistine champion Goliath, Saul became a bit jealous, eventually tries to kill David. David escapes to the wilderness and lives uh, as a bit of an outlaw for a time. And that's where we find him when our story begins. Samuel has just died, so David's grieving the loss of someone important in his life, and likely he's feeling a little stressed because instead of being king, he has to hide out in the wilderness on the run. So maybe it's not a total shock that he's feeling a bit touchy. It turns out there is not much to do when you're just hanging out in the wilderness. So David and his band of men find a productive way to spend their time. This area was a bit of a high crime district with the bandits and the outlaws and such. So David and his crew form an unofficial neighborhood watch group helping to protect the shepherds, the the herdsmen, who used the area to graze their animals. And from the the report that we get a little later in the story, they did a pretty good job. One of the herdsmen says, 
They were very good to us. They were like a wall. They, we suffered no harm when they were there. Okay, so far, so good. Now, when it comes to shearing time, there's typically a big feast to celebrate all the hard work that's been done, all the wool that's been produced. So David asks Nabal, the wealthy owner of all these sheep, could we have a little bit of the food? Could we share a little bit in your celebration? They've likely been surviving on subsistence rations out there in the wilderness for a long time, and their work is part of the reason for Nabal's success, after all. Seems like a reasonable request. But we've already learned Nabal is not a reasonable man. He is surly and mean, and his name literally means fool. I don't know what kind of mama names her kid fool, but there it is. And this Nabal, this fool, insults David, denies knowing him, and implies that he's nothing more than a runaway slave. David does not appreciate this response. He goes very quickly to, oh my gosh, this guy's an idiot. What is wrong with people? And then he takes it up a notch and says, I'm going to kill him. I regret having done this good deed for this man who returned evil for good. And he swears, I'm going to kill not just Nabal, but all of his men by tomorrow morning. That escalated quickly. Okay, so we've got two keyed-up men who seem intent on causing harm to one another, one through verbal violence and one through physical violence. This does not appear like it's going to end well until a woman enters the scene. Abigail, Nabal's wife, who we learn from the start is clever and beautiful. Now this week at VBS, we'll be talking about how creative she is as a peacemaker. And indeed, I think she is one of the Bible's most overlooked heroines who's able to be very, go very slyly into a dangerous situation and diffuse it and bring peace. She's got a lot of agency here in this story, and she's incredibly effective. But I want to take a minute to look at exactly what she does. So, she brings lots of food, way more than David probably originally was expecting. And she's a beautiful woman who bows down on the ground before him. She has gotten his attention. Then, she throws her husband under the bus. We'll cut her some slack there because it's not easy being married to a fool. Uh, and she asks David not to kill him. She's shrewd in how she positions herself here. She's clear in what she's asking. But then she does the most powerful thing of all. She reminds David who he is. And she reminds David who God is. Remember who you are. David. This isn't an action worthy of a prince of Israel. Remember God's anointing. Remember God's mercy. You are God's child, David. You are doing God's work. Don't stoop to the level of evil men. She says, if anyone should rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living under the care of the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. Eugene Peterson, whose interpretation of this text I'm greatly indebted to, he, he renders this line as, as this. If anyone stands in your way, if anyone tries to get you out of the way, know this. Your God-honored life is tightly bound into the bundle of God-given life. But the lives of your enemies will be hurled aside as a stone is thrown from a sling. Abigail witnesses 
God's word at work in David. She sees that David's life is so tangled up in God's that there's no way he can separate himself from it and still be himself. And how smart is it that she uses that image of a stone being thrown from a sling, painting a a picture that surely would take David's mind back to that moment he brought Goliath down with a single stone. Abigail speaks God back into his life. David sees himself again as God sees him, the anointed of God, a person in whom God was present and to be honored. He'd almost forgotten that in his small-sighted thirst for revenge. But Abigail's words open up for him again the wide world of God's love, forgiveness, holiness, and mercy. And that is what makes peace. Not fancy food or a pretty lady or smooth talking, although clearly those things didn't hurt. But what really brings peace It's the presence of God and the recognition of that presence in our lives. Has this ever happened to you? You were filled with righteous indignation against one who has hurt you, ready to strike back. And then an interruption. You drive by a field of wildflowers and are overcome by their beauty. A friend calls and reminds you how much they care about you. You return to that morning devotion and and read again about God's love for you. And you recognize once again the presence of the Lord. I believe that God continues to send us Abigails to open our eyes to the presence of God all around us through the beauty of art or music, through the life of the forest and streams and sky, through the words of scripture and prayer and holy conversation, through water and wine and bread, through the image of Christ reflected out from each person that we meet. God sends Abigails to remind us who we are and whose we are and how we can be most fully human only with God. And then, then, there is peace. Now, at VBS this week, that's where the story ends with that verse, but there's a few more verses that we aren't going to read with the kids. It gets a little more PG, but I'll tell you guys. So the rest of the story is that Abigail goes home, and Nabal has been partying. He is drunk, so she waits until morning to tell him what has happened. And when she tells him, it says, Scripture says, his heart died within him. He became like a stone. And about 10 days later, Nabal dies. And David? Well, he's not stupid. He hears Abigail's single again, and so he makes this beautiful, clever woman his wife. Now, of course, David had several wives. I wonder if Abigail was the one who kept the peace among them. You can imagine her helping McCall and Bathsheba work through a few differences. But alas, Abigail's voice is once again silenced in the biblical narrative, so we'll never know. But we are blessed to have this story where her voice shines through for kings and commoners to hear. And so as we continue to explore peace this week, may our peacemaking be inspired by Abigail. May we keep our eyes and ears and hearts 
open to the Abigails God sends us. And may we be open to be God's Abigail for someone else. And most of all, may we give thanks for the one in whom we truly find our peace. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.